Shantam 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 <laughs> Professor Christopher Chapel has been extremely kind to me to present whatever the work I have been doing without actually telling me what I should present. So I didn't actually have to prepare for this. Uh, so, in a sense, I came completely unprepared. Um, we had an intent, though, that uh, this occasion among greatest scholars um, will give me an opportunity to learn from their experience, some of them both practitioners and scholars and others are serious scholars in the field. Um, after I worked on Drishti Srishti, uh, a yoga vasista concept for my PhD, um, I wanted to continue on this non-intentional aspect of consciousness and the book I got from Rodley's Consciousness in Indian Philosophy I tried to address that issue there and for a few years I took a break in a sense I enjoyed uh, addressing image consciousness and uh, plantic visual culture and language of images. Um, both one has been out just two weeks ago and language of images is in print should be out in a month. So, in the past few years of trying to actually move away again from my work on Tantra back to uh, philosophical work on consciousness studies, I have been working, the original idea was to when I saw this uh, Ramana Bifarya, Bikalpa Nidra, Smrita Yaha, so if you have this um, yoga samadhi and then non samadhi states of chitta, what are these vrittis? So I got more interested in the vritti state rather than the pure consciousness state because I wrote two books on as if whatever I learned about those pure state of consciousness. So I have roughly 600 pages of single space document addressing uh, memory, uh, recognition, uh, samskara, uh, emotions, um, subject. Um, I'm reading Buddhist Jain and Hindu texts equally, uh, whether it is Harirama Bhattacharya, uh, Jagadisha Tarkalankara, or uh, Vyasa and uh, Vajaspati. So the idea is to readdress what can be relevant for a broader discourse on Indian epistemology, Indian psychology, uh, a, if there is a possibility of a distinctive model of cognitive science based on uh, some of these Indian philosophical schools. So what I am going to present today is uh, actually a small section from this uh, really unorganized uh, prod uh, a sort of a manuscript and even in that the particular section was about Asambra Gyanta in light of Samapatis. So to read the Pali canons and the Yogacara materials 
on their samapattis and relate them to the understanding of asamprajnata and how uh, maybe the phenomenological approach of usral and so forth uh, could not address this particular mode of consciousness. And so when I'm reading, I'm going to read my paper, but when I'm reading, I have just got here and there, and my friend Stephen, first, uh, uh, sorry, Philip Moss would agree with me that I'll be writing my own Bhasya if needed, because inside me there's a bigger book, and what I'm reading is just a small section. <laughs> Can I use this one now? Yes. This, this, this essay explores the phenomenological content or lack thereof of the highest state of ab yogic absorption called Asam Prajnata, as detailed in the commentarial literature on Patanjali Yoga Sutra, and compare some of these findings with the Abhidharma Yogachara materials. This yogic state poses two sets of problems. First, how is it possible to have a mental state that is not cognized, in the general sense that we understand cognition? The other challenge, again stemming from the content of this experience, rests on this experience being real. If samadhi experience is not a form of self-deception, the experience gained in this state should have certain verifiability. However, to the argument that this is a subjective experience and cannot be objectively verified, the response would be that all experiences are likewise subjective. The specific problem for this experience is that not only is the samadhi experience private, there is not even an active consciousness making the content of asamprajyata as an object of the mode of consciousness. In other words, there is no intentionality in this state of consciousness, and so even if this exists, there is no means to affirm its existence. Furthermore, is this experience pure in the sense that not constructed by any samskara, or is this like any other experience that is culturally and linguistically constructed? In the latter case, it is not possible to make a claim of having a perennial and transcultural entity as its object. These are not difficult questions to ask. However, they require a serious reading of the classical yoga and yogachara and abhidharma texts for their answers. According to Patanjali, Samadhi is a manifestation of only the content of experience as if devoid of the cognizing subject, Yoga Sutra 3.3. This definition brings multiple issues to the front. The first challenge stems from Patanjali's definition that Samadhi provides a direct encounter with the hyletic data, and borrowing a few terms from phenomenology, that has not been impaired by noesis. Rather than a mystical or ecstatic state, the samadhi experience then is a direct encounter with a bare object that has not been conditioned by mental clutter nor impaired by cognitive defects. If this is the case, it also goes without saying that there are bare objects that can be cognized more of like a direct realism. Albeit, when the subject aspect of experience has been bracketed from the experience, a transcendental reduction. To have a yogic experience, then, is not to have an experience of the self in isolation of object, but to experience an object in isolation of subject. It is our subjectivity that conditions knowledge and impairs our cognitive process and thus needs to be bracketed 
for a direct encounter with the object. While at the initial level, this reduction might appear to be comparable to a phenomenological reduction, the purview of Patanjalian, as well as Buddhist Samadhi experiences, transcends the phenomenological reduction even more clearly when the discussion moves to Asampajyata. Another pertinent issue is that there is a bare object, the phenomenological content, even of the Asampajyata experience, since the definition of Samadhi as laid out by Patanjali covers all of its varieties and the term manifestation of the bare object, artha matra nirvasa, does, not, does apply to all its varieties. Ultimately, what is the Samadhi that is as if devoid of its essential form, Surupa Sunyam Iva, in 3 and 3? Vyasa explains that in this state, there is a penetration of the essential nature of what is being conceptualized. Dheya Sobhava Vesa. That is, between the divide of the highlighted data and noises, it is as if the aspect of concept or representation is absent in consciousness and only the bare object is manifest. The next issue attached to this is, if there is no cognitive activity in this state, coming closer to the translation of awesome prajnata as non-cognitive, some have done so, how can one even be certain that such a cognitive mode does exist? The focus in a state of consciousness that is devoid of mental activity is found in the yoga literature subsequent to Patanjali with the application of terms such as Amanaska, Manurmani, Amani Bhava, or the concept of Amani Shikara in Indo-Tibetan Buddhism, points to the same direction of the yogis cultivating a state that essentially lacks the cognitive process. It is therefore relevant to pose a question of the possibility of such a state and to explore whether there is any phenomenal content embedded with this experience. So, what goes in the cultivation of Samadhi? Following Patanjali, the subject of experience, the Rastri, situates in its own essential form, Swarupa, at the state of cessation, Nirodha. Yoga Sutra 1, 2 to 3. Patanjali defines this perceiving subject as the very act of perceiving, and while being pure, this subject presumes the form of the concept. Drashta drishi matra suddhopi pratyanupasya. Noteworthy is that Patanjali identifies the subject with the act of consciousness, as the term identified with it is drishi, where a suffix in bhava merely describes the meaning of the verbal root drish. This consciousness, then, is not what has been grasped in the form of an object, nor is it the cognitive mode that is directed towards an object. It, therefore, is the transcendental stream of consciousness that allows the subject to rediscover its identity in the cognitive flow. This can be compared to the witnessing consciousness, Sakshin of the Advaita Vedantins. Albeit, it differs in the sense that the experience that is captured in Patanjalian concept of Kaivalya, isolation, refers to an isolation from the natural tendencies collectively identified as Prakriti, while the Advaita concept of liberation moksha relates to the experience of the identity of the subject or phenomenal consciousness with the transcendental consciousness, the Brahman. One of the questions posed earlier concerns the constructive nature of samadhi experience. If samadhi, ultimately yogis go to samadhi and all they discover is what they like to discover. If that is the case, then they are not discovering any higher truth. They are discovering whatever they like to imagine. So this is what the constructivists like Gimelo have been uh, advocating. So now, the samadhi experience if it's a, uh, a, a consequence of meticulous constructive cognitive process, then the samprajnata 
at least in the case of some prajnata, which appears to be the case, has a wide range of cognitive content, as one can glean from my friend Guru Ian Witcher, whom I will be referring uh, frequently in this paper. Um, in order to rise in the sequence of the samprajnata modes of samadhi experience, one has to meticulously cultivate particular cognitive states, and this cultivation does not cease continuing even in the asamprajnata. And now question comes, how can an experience that in <coughs> itself is constructed and a product of language and culture give rise to a correct vision of the way things are? The answer to this question can be found in two different texts. Maybe one in the Advaita text where they have this Akhanda Karavritti, a Brahma Karavritti, the concept of the form of the Brahman in giving rise to the awareness of the Absolute which in itself is devoid of concept and is transcendent to name and form. And also in the discourse on uh, Nirodha Samskara in the Patanjalian text. Both these discussions are essential in addressing whether or some prajnata is actually a conscious state that lacks intentionality and whether this state can be linguistically and culturally constructed like other states where cognitive faculties are explicit. So I'll go for one paragraph on the Advaitin side of argument. Following the Advaitins, the conceptualization of the Brahman is positive terms such as like being, awareness, bliss, which is distinct from the realization of the Brahman itself. So Sat, Chit, Ananda, uh, 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 whatever one actually actualizes the Brahman in terms of Sat, Chit, Ananda is not the realization of the Brahman. Uh, so. Uh, so the concept of the Brahman, while rendering other conceptual concepts new, also consumes itself as the Advaitin. Akhanda Karabriti, the beauty of this particular mode of consciousness is that while it consumes everything else, all the other rest of the concept, it also has to consume itself. So this is similar to this Asam Prajnata, not the Asam Prajnata that yogic practitioners consciously cultivate, but the asam prajnata that occurs in consequence of practicing this asam prajnata, that is what is the liberating consciousness we are addressing here. So following Patanjali, the experience of the isolation of the self from prakriti is due to the rise of the constructed conditions of cessation, nirodha samskara. Both the samadhi, Samprajnata and Asamprajnata. So these do cultivate samskara. And now we can even raise further questions. Can one even liberate if one is just cultivating samskaras? So while the latter leads to liberation, basically Asamprajnata supposedly, the first one helps to cultivate the wisdom that is replete with the absolute <coughs> truth. Yoga Sutra, first chapter. 48. That is, the function of the cognitive mode of absorption is to give insight to the way things are. When this stream of consciousness, the samskara that carries insight, attains its fruition, no constructed conditions remain to germinate further karma. Gas's observation in this discussion is noteworthy that the samskaras that simply negate other samskaras are contradictory to the function of the mind and thus do not cultivate further samskaras. His presentation is not different from the Advaita account of the concept of the Brahman and while the Nirodha samskara is still cultivated, its function is not to give insight but only to eliminate what has been falsely conceived or to eradicate the samskaras that envelop the subjects and prelude, preclude them from recognizing reality. From Vyasa's observation, it nonetheless becomes clear that samskaras are not conceptual. In other words, there is no intentionality in samskara itself. And this applies not only to the samskaras developed of nirodha or of the final absorption, but also of the waking state or the cognitive states of samadhi. 
following Vyasa, the properties associated with the constructed conditions of the waking state of the mind are not of the form of concepts and therefore are not stopped when the concepts are stopped. So also are the constructed conditions formed during cessation. So he explicitly mentions this in chapter 3, uh, Sutra 9. One of the problems in addressing the content of samadhi experience has been the issue of language. So now, can all samadhis be described in language? And are they all concept laden Or are some samadhis empty words in the sense that they do not have a corresponding concept? Again, uh, uh, Iyam brings the issue of translating two categories of samadhi and argues against the suggestion that asam prajata is somewhat unconscious. I'm sorry, my friend. I beg to differ here is the way we are using consciousness, not saying it is unconscious, not jumping to the other side either. The way we are using consciousness in the sense of having something intentional does not apply to chit and it applies only to buddhi, cognition. We need to, I think, distinguish otherwise uh, 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 the, the way of trying to explore the intentional modes of or non-intentional is uh, somehow misleading, can be misleading. Bhatsaspati, now I'm finding a lead in, Bhatsaspati is very clear on this issue when he says, quote unquote, the transcendental, changeless, and eternal power of chiti cannot be intentional or have any property of having something as its object of cognition, while the instrument of cognition buddhi can be as such. It is known that the state of awesome prajnata is devoid of the foundational state of chiti, but only that there is no functioning of cognitive modes and therefore no intentional object. I also refrain from appropriating the terms ecstasy and instasy from Eliade to describe the two modes of samadhi. Furthermore, even the reading uh, of Asam Pragyata does not tally with what I'm saying now. So in, in simply, simply put, this understanding is not congruent, in my opinion, with Patanjali's definition of samadhi as such where he equates samadhi with dhyan in he reads in sequence. Except that in the state of samadhi, what appears is only the content, as if devoid of the cognizing self. Bhatsaspati Mishra explicitly supports this definition when saying that, quote unquote, there is only the manifestation of the form of what has been meditated upon and not the image meditated as the act of meditation. Entities known through the cognitive modes are only images and not the real object. The samadhi of a yogin is a state that touches upon the bare object unmediated by the cognitive mode. Or this is chitti touching upon the object itself before the emergence of the instruments of cognition. So the only distinction between samprajata and asamprajata is that the second one, asamprajata, lacks external objects but nonetheless has the concept of the form of cessation. So there is just the virama pratyaya only, the, no other pratyayas but only the pratyaya left, there is no pratyaya left. And this is still is a pratyaya. <laughs> Vyasa expands upon the idea of virama pratyaya by saying that, then quote, since the meditative practice that has a support or an intentional object cannot be constructed as instrumental to asamprajnata thought, the concept of cessation is taken as support of the entity that in itself is devoid of any entity. This is empty of objects. This is what I find in uh, his writing in the, that is in on Yoga Sutra, Vyasa Bhasya. 118. Everyday cognition has the transcendent self witnessing the modes of consciousness that captures the images of the externals. Some 
on the other hand, is not intersected by the cognitive mode and therefore has direct access to the bare object. Awesome prajnata is distinct from both in the sense that it has neither cognitive mode or intervene, uh, I'm sorry, neither cognitive mode to intervene nor an external object to shine forth. What it has, nevertheless, is the concept of the cessation of all the cognitive modes. Also pertinent to this understanding is the Patanjalian hierarchy of the Samadhi states with explicit reference identified as Samprajnata. Following Yoga Sutra 142, the intentional object of Pitarka state involves the phenomenal content where language, reference, and cognition are collectively given. If translated into Husserian terminology, this state involves the awareness of the Heil, the noises, and Noima together. Now the raw data, Artha, the awareness of the awareness directed towards this object, Jnana, and the verbal reference Shabda is outlined to describe the Savitarka state allows us to analyze the content of this Samadhi accordingly. A question may arise, what constitutes this as a state of Samadhi if, after all, this state has all the cognitive modes that any other conscious states any other context he still has. The answer lies in the duration of the same phenomenal content held in the mind. While in everyday awareness, every conscious mode has a single moment of the duration of the phenomenal content in the mind, the Vitarga state sustains the content for a prolonged period. The Vartika of Yoga Sutra 3.2 is explicit on that. A subject's effort is required for sustaining the same thought for a prolonged period and therefore the subject always has a choice in constituting this state. This is not the case with a regular everyday state of consciousness. So the, the big thing happening about Samadhi is not like yogis are seeing the unicorns, yogis are still <laughs> seeing the same thing, but they are more focused. <laughs> Besides all other concepts, Asamprajyata cannot retain time awareness either. A question emerges, in the absence of temporal awareness, how can a yogin measure his progression into Samadhi? When Vyasa says, quote in quote, the, the existence of the constructed conditions caused by mind in the state of cessation can be inferred based on the experience of the sequence of time in the duration excuse me in the duration of cessation when he says that he is not applying that the sequence of time is experienced during the cessation of thoughts but that when a yogin comes out of samadhi he infers the lapse of time Progression into Samadhi is not something a yogin can measure while in that state, but only when he is awake and it can be measured by comparing duration of time in different instances of Samadhi. And if there is some progression to measure in different instances of awesome Prajnata, it is required that the earlier instance is constituting Samskara or the progression would not be possible we would be always there. It is through the agreement in absence, Betireka, if there were no constructed conditions of this state, there should be no gradual progression in the duration of time in progressive instances of Samadhi, that the progression is unfurled. In other words, there is no temporal awareness in Asim Prajnana. Nevertheless, it does not constitute Sanskara so that future Asim Prajnana states are for the refine. This samskara originated of samadhi is not karmically binding type samskara. Because all the samskaras should be karmically binding, otherwise. As it one why why is it so? Is as it only counteracts the karmically binding samskaras originated of non-samadhi modes of consciousness. It's uh, one of the anarchist guy who works within society but helps to deconstruct the society. 
So this asamprajyanta type samskara is a samskara that allows to collapse all the samskaras. A question emerges, so what is the content of the samskara then? As it has been maintained that there is samskara of the earlier instant of asamprajyanta that helps a yogin progress in the future instances. Apparently, the very cessation nirodha is what is being progressed, or what is what is the content of this absorption? Just the just the start, just not having samskara is the samskara there. In this state, there is no positive entity or an intentional object for forming samskara. There is apparently a thin margin to distinguish uh, asamprajyanta and the sleep, the nidra. In the first, it is the concept of the form of cessation of all the concepts, that's a virama pratyaya. In the case of nidra, in the second, it is the concept of absence. That's just like the absence of concept or the concept of absence. Uh, so that distinguishes uh, uh, nidra and samadhi. Otherwise, there is hardly any externally, let's say, distinguishable characteristic between these two. So, however, the concept of cessation is directly apprehended by the self, as there is no mental mode, vritti, or this would violate the very definition of yoga as the cessation of the vritti, chitta vritti, nirodha. So, if there is still is some kind of vritti, so sleep accordingly is one of the vrittis. So the distinction again is in nidra, there is a vritti uh, because it's one of the vrittis, but uh, samadhi is supposed to be, yoga should be vritti nirodha, so it could not have a vritti. Returning to the main conversation, the asamprajata mode of absorption is credited with eliminating all the constructed conditions and consequently consciousness remains luminous, pure and it's in, in its own form. What has not been thoroughly explained in the consequence of this state, Asamprajata gives the direct revelation of the self or Purusha, which is called as such only in relation to the mind or chitta appropriating <coughs> external objects through various intentional modes. So I would like to skip a little bit here. So now basically what I would like to point out here is that in the absence of terminology to translate differently the terms chit, chiti on one hand and bhiti are all these uh, instances of consciousness, um, the term consciousness has been overused. Uh, the transcendental consciousness that the self actualizes uh, as self-seeing uh, and the cognitive modes that rest on the transcendental consciousness for them to achieve the status of consciousness are two explicitly distinct categories in the yoga of Patanjali. So in other words, Husserl's phenomenology is applicable in my opinion only up to the state of some pragyanta or in when there is a buddhi or some kind of chitta is there. What has not been rejected in the state of asamprajyata is the ground that makes the physical buddhi to behave as if conscious or to retain the mental imprint. Through a series of reduction, yogic absorption reveal, uh, sorry, reverses the mind from its external flow to experiencing the internal cognitive processes and as a consequence, the very mind ceases its functioning. The self in this paradigm is a mere seeing or the power of consciousness, chitti shakti. Asamprajata is a state where this chitti shakti is known without any external means. So, in Conclusion, it's clear that the constructed conditions of having nothing as the cognitive content, not even absence that is conceptual and is expressible in language, which is the case with Nidra, do not have intentionality and thus cannot be an object of 
this asamprajyata in essence cannot be an object of phenomenological reduction. However, this is the case with all the constructed conditions, which I think is applicable. And now, following Abhidharma, Nirodha and Asamji states are the mind dissociated dharmas. Following Patanjali, these are still the states of the mind. So, there's some kind of distinction in understanding between Abhidharma and Patanjali. So, I just kind of completely took out uh, the whole discussion of the um, uh, Asamji Nirodha. Uh, issue. So now, let me just go to conclude here. Patanjali, what we now get it is Patanjali and paradigm opens up the possibility of a non conceptual state that is therefore of interest for uh, psychological analysis, uh, for cognitive science, and also for understanding. Uh, for the um, religious studies experts, what is this mystical state? I am not into that, but uh, it's just also if there is some kind of a constructed conditionality there or not. And for philosophy, can we actually address uh, Yogacara's Amala Vigyana type consciousness or some Pragyata type consciousness in yoga or uh, the highest experience of the Advaita Vedantin? Uh, is, is there a possibility for a different type of uh, phenomenology to uh, address uh, intentional consciousness without rejecting or without reducing this foundational premise of these systems? That's all I would like to stop here. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, just start with a little bit of a funny comment that it sounds when he's speaking with this beautiful Nepali accent that he's saying the awesome prajñata, yes. so, <laughs> which actually carries the meaning of the word quite nicely. So we have time for a couple of questions. Okay, if no one else has a question, I do. Um, so I Can you identify yourself? Hi, I'm Michelle Bonet. Nice to meet you. Um, I don't want to get lost in this because I may have been lost at some point, but um, are you suggesting that the experience that, an experience that negates original samskara does not contribute to further samskara? Did I hear that correctly? Does not contribute to the type of samskaras that we are accustomed to and in general the samskaras that uh, lead to new conditionality but it does constitute the type of samskara which is of the character of erasing all the samskaras so it does it we can still call it samskara for the lack of words, because we are used to calling samskara for when there is a habit pattern or some kind of a constructed conditionality is there, it does not create consciousness to have a particular pattern which anticipates a new becoming or new being, new form. Uh, but it does constitute the type of samskara which rejects any type of new becoming. So this is, a, uh, I'm just saying after all, it does constitute samskara, but this cannot be cognized and rejecting intentionality of samskara altogether. Samskaras could not be any way intentional, but above all, this particular samskara could not constitute any type of habit pattern that would lead to new formation or new birth. Thank you. My name is Dean Anand. I just wanted to ask you, would you compare the Asamprat uh, Samadhi state to the fourth state in Mandukya Upanishad, where you call Turiya state too, or you can call, you know, we got Jagrat state, Swapan state, Sushapti state, and then the fourth state. Would you compare that to that? Maybe, that's a, that's kind of a big two disciplines here. I tried to navigate uh, between these disciplines
by actually breathing, like uh, my friends like Philip Mars would not even like that, using a Khandakara Vritti type conversation, uh, just to jump in inside this uh, Patanjalian discourse. Uh, but I do believe that uh, whether in the form, I'm going even beyond Vedanta and Yoga, I'm embracing Yogacara. I'm embracing Abhidharma canons and I'm, I'm just arguing for the constitution of a particular type of sanskara that allows one to erase all other types of sanskara. Um, in the case of Vedanta, the, the, what we call consequence of having such a state is described differently. In the case of uh, uh, yoga, it is described slightly differently. So um, it's like we all may fly to New York, but might do different things. Uh, maybe the method is the same, and they may lead to the same erasure of samskara, but still they might have a post, some type of a uh, uh, samskara they are already creating of what to anticipate when everything is over. So I think they are still creating some type of samskara in that sense that they are anticipating something, even the erasure of samskara and anticipation and in that sense I think there is some difference. The man wrote the book on this. Um, I wonder about <coughs> The power you describe uh, some samadhi samskaras is most powerful, actually. And it seems that uh, an entire science of uh, yoga psychotherapy could be based upon the power of such uh, samskaras, which uh, they can erase uh, other samskaras, yes, like Yoga Sutra 150 and so on. Could you say something about that, about the power of, of what does it mean, samadhi samskaras? And what power do they do have? Um, I'm, I'm reading for this particular issue two different disciplines. One is the Yogacara way of reading samskara. One another is more of uh, mainstream Hindu or uh, Yoga Sutra Nyaya. I'm kind of bonding them together. And what I see is um, the intentionality or a sort of a continuity of consciousness itself for like a dharma kirti is very ex explicit in uh, explaining samskara as not something distinct from vijjana. The very vijjana that continues further is samskara and it just kind of comes in a different form. But for these folks that we are addressing here, samskara is quite different. Uh, it's not the same Vijjana's continuation, or it does not have intentionality, I'm borrowing a Husserlian term. Having said that, what type of power do they have to help erase? Uh, one thing given is, when we just sit, I mean, that is where practice has to be addressed. And, and we cannot, I think, do only the uh, uh, laptop yoga sutra studies. Uh, people who have been practicing samadhi do have their behavioral change, and that can be monitored now, even with fMRI and all. So there is a behavioral pattern changed which can be neurologically analyzed. But what allows this change? Maybe the regular overload of data that our brain is accustomed to is stopped uh, at that state of samadhi. Therefore, it does not have to constitute or replicate uh, the similar samskaras or create deeper samskaras of the negative patterns, which we often like to remember. Uh, because positive, positive experiences do not leave behind as deep scars or traces for memory as do the negative experiences. So samadhi, particularly asambrajyata, being 
the uh, sort of a non, uh, not negative or more like a neutral experience would not create, I think, any type of forming. But what power does it have? I do not know. Maybe you could eliminate it. I'm not as advanced. <laughs> Okay, I'd like us all to stand and to turn 360 degrees. <laughs> and I want to thank <laughs> Professor Timosina. Introduce Ms. Shila Devi, who will bring us up to the noon hour. Yay. Oh, I thought you were going to say bring us up to this century or the millennium. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, do you want to do this? Or this? Above, so yeah. What? About 20 minutes or so. Oh, so we just cut it from 40 to 40. Okay. 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 Uh, keep standing for a second. <coughs> keep standing for a second. Stand up. <laughs> Stretch up to the heavens. Let's, let's bring the heavens and earth together. And as you do it, let's see how good you can chant Oh, Ready? Oh. is very different than some of what we've been hearing and uh, I think this is the beauty of yoga. This is what I love about <laughs> yoga. To me I see yoga as the hub of the wheel and we each see what we can take from it and how it can be useful in our lives. Because as a student of the Yoga Sutras and a student of yoga for many years, and no matter what you do to me, I will never tell you how many. Um, I was so involved in it and so immersed in it that I chose to become a monk, a swami, and I was that for 20 years. And what that led me to do was really go into the practices. And I thank you for saying that at the end of your talk because I love the way you called it laptop yoga. Uh, I think that's great because I think we need both. We need, the, we need to understand, but we also need the experience, the visceral feeling, the, the amount of um, knowledge that comes from not hearing about it, but actually experiencing something in that way. And that's where I think that 
I was very, very blessed to have had that immersion, that meditating three times a day, that doing asana, pranayama, etc., twice a day, for so many years that it brought me to a different place in the study of the Yoga Sutras than perhaps I might have been in before. When I first got involved, uh, it's funny because yoga therapy is definitely the way people are moving in yoga now. And I came at it sort of the opposite way. I was in medicine before, and then when I realized the limitations of the physical body, I decided I wanted to know more about what was making that physical body and making that physical body function. And that's where I came to the love of the Yoga Sutras. It was interesting that Chris was talking about um, Swami Vivekananda because he's one of my heroes. And um, he was actually, when I started studying, there were two books that you could read at that point. One was Raja Yoga by Swami Vivekananda and the other was How to Know God, the original How to Know God. Sometimes book titles are recycled, and this one was. But I'm talking about the original with Swami Prabhavananda and Christopher Isherwood. Those were the only ones I knew. And I tried to study. I tried to really study this and realized that study has a lot of different meanings for people. Some study with the mind and some study with the heart. If you take the root of the word study back to its original, you'll find that it means to love. To, to study something is to love something. And this is how I felt about yoga and the Yoga Sutras. Most of my experience of the Yoga Sutras, at least in the beginning years, came from directly sitting with my teacher, Swami Satchidananda, who brilliantly, as I'm now appreciating even more than then, brought this into our lives. How we lived our life was the Yoga Sutras. It wasn't something that was put on a shelf. And being a woman who was now allowed to study, because for millenniums, we weren't. And there's lots of reasons that I've heard. Some say, oh, you didn't need it. Some said you were too smart. Some said you were too stupid. Anything, and I've heard them all. But for some reason, now it is merging. It is coming back. So my first experience with the study or not study came when I was doing a little retreat in the mountains of Colorado with one of the senior swamis. And on our way back into Denver, where we had an institute, where we taught yoga, he said to me, I'm leaving tomorrow. And I said, oh, where are you going? He said, I'm leaving the organization. And I said to him very glibly, I said, oh, what's going to happen with your Raja Yoga course that you started? And he reached down into his briefcase and pulled up a copy of How to Know God, handed it to me, and said, start studying. <laughs> I don't remember ever being that scared or nervous. I, I was a novice. I didn't know anything, or so I thought. And the only thing that I could figure in doing in that 48 hours was not to study all these great books, etc., was to pray. I prayed harder than I think I've ever prayed. Well, maybe sometimes else. And what happened was something phenomenal. I started to understand the sutras from a very different way. From my heart instead of my head. And this led me then to begin to teach and to continue teaching and ultimately write down what I was experiencing and what I was teaching to other people who then were able to learn it in a way that not everybody can learn through the mental capacity. Is one better than the other? Absolutely not. But learn how you can learn from the Yoga Sutras.
When I was working with people who are ill, at the beginning I was a little bit, what word would I use, not available to them, the whole yoga. I thought they couldn't understand this. And then I started to experience people actually going into samadhi on their first time. Do we call it beginner's luck? We could. <laughs> because that's what happened. They would say to me, I merge with that rose that you showed me in meditation. I, I experienced all this. And suddenly, everything changed. So, what we begin to see is when we look at the practices, when we look at what the sutras are telling us, we tend to look at them from a very simplistic view, and our view. There's a wonderful word in Sanskrit that I always refer to, and that's the word varna. I love the word varna, it means color. And what they're talking about is the mind reflects certain colors. And in this color, I realized everybody has a different color that they're seeing this particular thing through. When we got to the point, which is probably has become one of the most popular aspects of the Yoga Sutras, before the, the idea of asana came in anyway, and even now it's emerging, are the yama and the yama. And the first time that this was talked about to me outside of my realm of study, Everybody started referring to it as the Ten Commandments of Yoga. <laughs> you know, it's still, it doesn't get me like it did before, but it still gets me a little bit. Because here to me, they have taken this very highly refined and very precise way of explaining how we would live when we are actually a realized yogi. How would we live in this world? And they have reduced it to finger shaking. Don't do this and don't do that. So I had to ask myself, why is everything translated in the negative? Why do we think that if we put un in front of something or non, like non-violence, why do we think the positive would emerge from that? I couldn't, I couldn't imagine because the English language doesn't have a lot of positive words to describe these states. So we, whoever was translating decided to take the non or the un. And it's an interesting concept to me because if we think about something or someone as non-violent, does that actually mean that they're kind and loving? Or does that mean they're restraining? I actually had a very interesting experience. Uh, I was in India recently, and um, coming out of our hotel one morning to go somewhere in Delhi, there was a cluster of what I would call suits standing in the lobby. And I walked over to see what was going on, because it was very curious. And right in the middle of all this group of suits was this figure in this reddish color robe. So I got a little closer, because I wanted to see, and sure enough, he turned around and it was unmistakably the Dalai Lama. Oh, yeah. couldn't, couldn't miss him, he just was there. He saw me and immediately stopped what he was doing and came over to me. Oh. Took my hands and said, hello, where are you from? <laughs> and I told him and then my husband joined me at that point and we, started to walk through the doors. He had a car waiting for him to be swept away. And I stood by him. My husband said, can we take a picture? He said, of course. Now, we've all taken pictures with people, right? And generally, what happens is everybody stands there, especially with someone who's important. You don't want to do anything. So you stand there like this, opposite. He took my hand, pulled it into him, and held it like this. He even said he liked my purple hair. <laughs> After the picture was taken, he looked at us and he said, 
There are seven billion people on this planet. The problem is we see them as us.